Did a lost civilization once live in the Amazon rainforest that has been erased from our collective memory? It is already clear that history needs to be rewritten. Researchers have long assumed that the indigenous peoples of Central and South America lived in sparsely populated, widely dispersed city-states. However, the latest discoveries now prove the opposite. The former jungle dwellers created gigantic metropolises in which millions of people lived. Despite this, the Amazon rainforest still resembles an archaeological mystery. But what are the riddles that experts have been racking their brains over for ages? Do we even know an explanation for all the historical inconsistencies? Or do we perhaps have to delve into areas that the mainstream considers impossible? If you had paid attention in history class, then you would certainly be familiar with the Aztecs, and you would also have heard of the legendary Maya. But what about the Olmecs? This earliest known civilization in Central America should be in the spotlight of historians, but there is a huge problem. The truth is that this ancient people, whose traces date back to 1200 BC, has always been accompanied by huge question marks. This begins with the question of their actual ethnic affiliation and extends to the question of their exact area of distribution. What we do know is that the existence of the Olmecs can be proven along the coast of the Gulf of Mexico and that they have left us a series of mysterious artifacts that regularly become the focus of heated debates. The dimensions of the so-called colossal heads show that this is literally a huge historical puzzle. The oversized stone skulls weigh up to 25 tons and some are 2.8 meters high. And yet the impressive dimensions are by no means the core of the mystery, because the appearance of the colossal heads also seems unusual, to put it mildly. In detail, the facial features are by no means reminiscent of the classic Native Americans, but rather have Polynesian or African features. Many an alternative researcher has taken this as an opportunity to pose a question that turns our current view of history on its head. Could it be that the cultures of antiquity were in direct contact with each other? And while we're on the subject of alternative researchers, the name Graham Hancock should of course not go unmentioned. Contrary to initial assumptions, however, Hancock does not believe that the unusual appearance of the colossal heads is as profound as it first appears. And there is a very simple reason for this. There is no such thing as the classic Native Americans. In reality, the genetic history of indigenous peoples is highly complex and has been influenced by a multitude of different factors. Despite this, according to Hancock, there is something that connects the ancient cultures of Central America with the rest of the world and which massively challenges the official historiography. Does this small detail reveal the truth about the history of civilization? To understand what this means, Hancock says we need only to look at a very specific artifact once discovered in the La Venta archaeological site in Mexico. In fact, it is one of the oldest known depictions of a feathered serpent. The Aztecs and the Maya knew this bizarre deity under the name Quetzalcoatl, and it was already regarded by many other Mesoamerican cultures as the god of peace and bringer of civilization. In the case of the above-mentioned discovery, however, the special feature is hidden in the detail. We can actually see a person sitting in the middle of the serpent's body and holding something extremely strange in his hand. A structure that somehow looks like a handbag. Things become even more puzzling when we realize that researchers are by no means only familiar with this depiction from Central America, because in reality, it has appeared in practically every corner of the world. For example, the bag was also immortalized in the artwork of the Sumerians, and it even adorns a pillar in Gobekli Tepe. To put it in context, located in modern-day Turkey, the roots of this time-honored site date back to the 10th millennium BC and it is home to some of the oldest known large structures in human history. But how could it be that so many different cultures that never officially met knew one and the same symbol? What do these astonishing parallels mean? And what was the ominous handbags in the first place? Well, it is generally assumed that the objects had a divine context. It is possible that the objects were intended to represent the cosmos, but alternatively, they could have also contained the hidden knowledge that the gods reveal to humans. According to Graham Hancock, however, the widespread distribution of the bags proves one thing overall. A highly developed civilization existed long before our time, which has now been completely forgotten. 
While most of the advanced culture fell victim to a global flood at the end of the last ice age, the few survivors went out into the world to bring the gift of civilization to the simpler peoples. Because of their extraordinary abilities, the mysterious newcomers were revered as divine beings. But in truth, they were ordinary people who were simply several generations ahead of their contemporaries. Who were the Almecs, really? At this point, let's go back to the colossal heads. Assuming that the stone skulls were ultimately intended to reflect the appearance of their creators, how is it that the Olmecs looked so unusual? Well, in this regard, Hancock emphasizes that several human skulls have already been found in Brazil that can be best described with the word anomalous. Just like the stone artifacts, the real bones also have characteristics that we would normally expect to find in Africa or Polynesia. Some researchers have seized on this puzzling fact to substantiate a provocative theory. The colonization history of the American double continent actually took a very different course than generally assumed. A theory that, according to Hancock, is also supported by DNA analysis. All in all, the Britain describes the history of the continent as very strange and extremely complicated. A few years ago, the extraordinary skull finds were subjected to scientific examination and the rather unspectacular result showed that they are more related to the indigenous peoples of the Americas than to any other group in the world. The assumption that the Olmec's roots lay in Africa or Polynesia thus seemed to be refuted. But at the time of the analysis, the methods were nowhere near as sophisticated as they are today. And according to Hancock, more recent series of tests have indeed revealed that the skulls contain, quote, evidence of an Australasian meaning, in the broadest sense, the region around Australia, New Zealand, New Guinea, and Indonesia. Despite this, the true origins of the Olmecs remains an unsolved mystery for the time being. The same applies to the question of whether they can actually be regarded as predecessors of the Maya. For Hancock, however, the obvious parallels are indisputable. These begin with the momental buildings of both cultures and extend to the mysterious Mayan calendar, which, according to Hancock, the Olmecs passed on directly. This spectacular discovery is rewriting history. Researchers of the past were firmly convinced that the indigenous peoples of the Americas lived in scattered groups that were only loosely connected, if at all. However, the breathtakingly sensational discovery made a few years ago in the jungles of Guatemala show that this outdated assumption has absolutely nothing to do with historical reality. In reality, there is something slumbering beneath the unmanageable canopy of leaves that the earlier experts would never have dared dream of, a colossal network of interconnected metropolises with millions of inhabitants. All in all, the scientists found the remains of more than 60,000 houses, palaces, elevated roads, and other structures. The Maya are considered to be the creators of the forgotten jungle cities, but how did this archaeological sensation come about? Did the scientists, armed with machetes and mosquito nets, slog through the thickets of the rainforest hoping to land a direct hit somewhere? Well, not quite. Because thanks to modern technology, it's no longer even necessary to set foot in the jungle to uncover its secrets. The technical miracle that makes this possible goes by the name of LIDAR. It is a revolutionary laser scanning technology that is able to digitally scan the treetops of the jungle and thus bring to light things that have been hidden under the dense foliage for centuries. What is the secret of the huge earth images? However, the ruins of former metropolises are not the only thing that the rainforest has now revealed. In this regard, Graham Hancock also refers to the equally gigantic and enigmatic geoglyphs. The oldest of these huge images of the earth are thought to have been created 2,000 years ago and quite a few of them are several hundred meters tall. But what was the original purpose behind their creation? Well, we have no idea, because until recently, we didn't even know they existed. A recent LiDAR mapping revealed that between 10,000 and 20,000 unknown earthworks, geoglyphs, and traces of settlements lie dormant under the rainforest canopy. However, it is completely unknown how many witnesses of days long past are really hidden in the Amazon basin. In fact, the presumed number is only a rough estimate, and the earthworks found so far probably only account for 4-9% to 9 of the total number. 
Unfortunately, the fact that the jungle is currently revealing more secrets than ever is due to a very sad circumstance. Many discoveries only come to light as a result of deforestation. Conversely, no one can say how many irreplaceable testimonies to time have already been devoured by the flames. With regard to the geoglyphs, vague explanations suggest that they were either fortifications or ceremonial sites. Graham Hancock believes that the latter is the case. In his conversations with the indigenous population, he has learned that the structures were most likely used for shamanic journeys. While the community gathered in the structures, there were certain areas that were only reserved for the shamans. There they would then embark on their spiritual journeys and possibly consume the hallucinogenic potion ayahuasca. However, the indigenous inhabitants also emphasize that they cannot say with absolute certainty why the imposing buildings were built. Their date of origin is simply too far in the past. And yet, the existence of the geoglyphs was known among the indigenous people long before the extensive clearing work. The researchers hope that LIDAR will enable us to uncover many more of these structures in the future without destroying the jungle. Small research teams could then advance to the structures and examine them at close range. Alfred Isaac Middleton and Percy Fawcett were both explorers of the late 19th century. The men's lives show some interesting parallels. Both were in the jungle searching for lost civilizations and secret cities. Both disappeared without a trace, leaving behind only a camera and pictures, respectively, of bizarre places and natives you've never seen before, guaranteed. To this day, experts argue about whether the pictures and reports of the two adventurers and explorers are authentic, and in the case of Alfred Middleton, it is sometimes even doubted that he really existed. Too fantastic, too crazy, and too not of this world seem to be the stories and pictures that both men have left to posterity. Alfred Isaac Middleton If you believe today's historians, Alfred Isaac Middleton never existed. The man suddenly appeared in reports by the famous British writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. For those who do not immediately know who he is, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was the author of the famous adventures of Sherlock Holmes and his friend Dr. Watson. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle supposedly owned a very comprehensive documentation of the life and disappearance of the explorer and adventurer, Alfred Isaac Middleton. The writer's assistant was himself an avid explorer. Through Sir John Morris, the accounts eventually came into the hands of Smithsonian Magazine, which initially published many of the texts and images without doubting their authenticity. The story of Alfred Isaac Middleton can be seen as truly fantastic. A Briton of no particular distinction, he is said to have traveled mostly in Asia in the late 19th century. There he made his way through the dense rainforests in search of secret places, treasures, and legendary lost cities. One of his last journeys took the adventurer to a remote area of China. There, the treasure hunter and explorer's destination was a mystical city called Daolito. According to the reports of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's former assistant, the path led the adventurer on a route along a lake called Lop. This lake still exists today, except that it has almost completely dried up in the 21st century. Lop Salt Lake is located on the eastern edge of the Tarim Basin between the Talakaman and Kamtag deserts in the southeastern part of China's Xinjiang province. Daolatu was, in legends, a fantastic gold city that is said to have contained a mystical female figure that came directly from Atlantis. Alfred Middleton never returned from his last mission. All that remained to posterity of the enigmatic adventurer were his camera and various accounts of his disappearance. The most catchy story tells of Middleton being captured by natives who wanted to prevent the Briton from plundering treasures of their culture. It is in this captivity that Middleton is said to have died. The Camera of the Adventure Left behind was the camera of adventure and the photos in it already put people at great amazement in the 19th century. At that time, no one doubted the authenticity of the reports and pictures. It was a time of the craziest discoveries. At the time of colonization, people constantly got to see pictures of never-before-seen animals, human races, or fantastic cities. It wasn't until the present day that these images came under increasing criticism for simply seeming too weird to be real. The images you see here are not from Middleton's last mission to China's Tarim Basin. These images were most likely taken in the dense jungles of Sumatra. 
On Sumatra, the explorer is said to have maintained intensive contact with locals and searched for sunken cities and treasures in the most remote regions. These strange buildings were inhabited in Middleton's time by a race of people who looked as strange as their dwellings. The buildings of this settlement seem to have blended with the surroundings in a wonderful way. High-rise buildings that look as if they were built on long stilts or from roofs, as well as buildings that resemble temples or multi-story mushroom-shaped dwellings. The architecture and construction methods appear truly out of this world. Similarly, the native has a striking egg-shaped head, a hairy face, and a very large, flattened nose. Other images show heavily hairy human-like creatures. Later, the photographs were examined several times and their authenticity was questioned. No such city or people resembling these images are known to exist on Sumatra today. Although this island still has thousands of square kilometers of dense jungle land and areas where hardly any white person ever goes, current historians and Asia experts believe they can safely rule out the possibility that these buildings and people ever existed. But that this must not be true, these photographs show. The strange mushroom-shaped buildings resemble the tough buildings of Cappadocia. The buildings in Turkey today also seem out of this world, and yet, there they are. In Cappadocia, the buildings just weren't overgrown with dense jungle. It was easy for contemporary archaeologists to find them, and scientists could undoubtedly declare them real. Photographs like this and sketches, which supposedly to be made of Middleton himself, have a great similarity with buildings of a likewise Indonesian culture, which settled on the neighboring island of Java. The Hindu Brahmanan temples, along with the Buddhist temple complex of Boradura, belong to the recognized world culture heritage of this world. As you can see in the case of the remaining camera of the adventurer Alfred Middleton, it is not so easy to exclude that these pictures are not real. What interest would a man have to forge pictures if he himself disappeared in the 19th century and never sought the attention of the public? Middleton is said to have been only interested in adventure and gold. Allegedly, he had recovered incredible treasures during his travels in Sumatra and hid them somewhere in coffin-like artifacts. To this day, adventurers and the curious search for the treasures of Alfred Isaac Middleton. Percy Fawcett's Search for the City of Z That Percy Fawcett really existed is an established historical fact. Percival Harrison Fawcett was born in southern England on August 18, 1867. At the beginning of the 20th century, several expeditions took him to the jungles of South America. He was to carry out surveying work there on behalf of the British Crown. However, the experienced soldier and former agent of the Secret Intelligence Service, the forerunner of MI6, is said to have soon become increasingly interested in things outside his actual assignment in South America. Locals told Fawcett many stories about mysterious cities and sunken treasures. In Brazil, the legend of the fabled City of Manoa caught Fawcett's particular interest. A chief of the Nambahakra Indians had described this place as a stone city or black city. The ruined city was said to lie hidden beneath the jungle on a plain of Mato Grosso near the Rio Zingu. In the archives of Rio de Janeiro, Fawcett is shown to have searched for a long time for clues to the mysterious city, which he himself called only Z. With a 1753 document containing another account of Portuguese sailors and adventurers who had set out inland in 1743 to explore the rainforest for gold and silver mines, Fawcett set out on his search. In the years to come, Percy Fawcett continued to work officially for the British Crown, while also raising financiers for a private search for the mysterious city of Z. In 1920, he set out on a seventh and final expedition to the Mato Grosso region. Percy Fawcett never returned from this trip. In the jungle, a quarrel is said to have arisen between the eccentric Fawcett and his men. After three of his followers abandoned him, Fawcett had to fend for himself with two remaining followers and disappeared. Several searches were unsuccessful until 1927 when name tags from Fawcett's expedition boxes turned up among an Indian tribe. According to the stories, Fawcett and his men had been killed by natives. Fawcett's Fantastic Pictures In the end, all that remained of this adventurer were some wild stories and photographs. 
These photographs are said to come from the estate of the man who spent more than 10 years intensively searching for treasures in the jungle forests of South America. On display, in addition to strange-looking natives, are particularly alarming depictions of reliefs showing scenes with artifacts reminiscent of flying saucers and entities in spacesuits. Another image shows a tethered, previously unknown animal that undoubtedly resembles a dinosaur. Again and again, rumors appear that in the most remote areas of the Amazon region, there are still descendants of dinosaurs or very rare and hitherto unknown species of lizards. All this is possible. Nevertheless, the authenticity of these pictures was also doubted. Several times, experts claimed that the pictures did not come from the official estate of Percy Fawcett and were created much later. The Truth Behind the Lost Cities One may marvel or smile at the authenticity of the pictures of Alfred Middleton and Percy Fawcett, but the fact is that a whole series of incredible cities and places have already been found on this earth which were overgrown by dense jungles for centuries. The famous Khmer city, Angkor, was rediscovered only in 1860 by a French philosopher and naturalist Henri Mahout. At that time, the several square kilometers large city, which is said to have once housed up to 100,000 people, lay almost completely hidden under dense jungle. It is a very similar story with Sagoria, the lion fortress in the middle of Sri Lanka's jungle. This city was also a legend for a long time, until it was rediscovered by chance. The entrances to the Wonder City, located on a plateau, were completely overgrown by jungle. So, we cannot exclude the possibility that other sunken cities and mysterious places are hidden in the vast jungle areas of this world. In South America, the Amazon region is the largest contiguous and most impassable jungle area on Earth today. To this day, Indians live in these areas who have hardly ever seen a white person in their entire lives and would like to keep it that way. Nevertheless, researchers continue to make their way through remote areas and dense forests and discover incredible things. Just this year, researchers in southwestern Amazonia found 11 previously unknown settlements of the Kasarabi culture. The remains of the settlements, dating from between 500 and 1400 AD, are unusually large and complex. The remains provide evidence of the presence of canal systems and roads that connected the sites to surrounding smaller settlements. Today, these sites are located in the middle of the jungle where no one would expect to find traces of ancient, tropical advanced civilizations. Apparently, in the middle of the jungle truly existed cities, which had infrastructure and a very high development. Aerial laser surveys showed, in particular, two large complexes with a four-tier settlement system and a division into a civil and a ceremonial district. In addition to buildings and streets, there are said to have been conical pyramids of up to 22 meters high. To this day, the site is largely overgrown by dense jungle. Whether the site will be excavated in search of treasure is currently unclear. Current finds like this prove once again that we do not know everything about this earth by far, and that hidden worlds come to light again and again. In 2003, a mysterious incident occurred in the vicinity of a Russian lake. The life jacket of a US soldier, allegedly killed in an accident in Yemen, floated in the waters of Lake Bezidoni, north of Moscow. But how did it get there? The case was the prelude to the whole new investigation into the big question of whether secret civilizations and underground connections between continents can exist on our planet. How did the vest end up in the lake? A village government employee was amazed when he found a U.S. Navy life jacket at Lake Bezidoni near the Russian city of Solnechegorsk in 2003. The identification inscription showed that the find belonged to a sailor named Sam Belovsky, who had served on the USS Cole. The U.S. Navy destroyer had been blown up in an assassination attempt in the harbor of the Yemeni city in Aden on October 12, 2000. In that accident, four sailors were tragically killed and ten went missing, including Sam Belovsky, whose life jacket turned up in Russia three years later. There continued to be no trace of Sam Belosky, and the question arose as to how the life jacket had narrowly escaped from the Indian Ocean into a tiny lake north of Moscow. 
The distance between Aden in Yemen and Lake Benzedoni is 4,000 kilometers if one were to use a dead straight air route. Some para-researchers came by this mysterious incident again on an old secret which, let's say, is not so secret at all. For it is said to have been known in some circles for a long time that there are tunnels in the Earth's interior that extend 1,000 kilometers and connect entire continents. The existence of such tunnel systems is supposed to be kept a secret for certain reasons. Of course, in this world, there are a lot of tunnels under the Earth and caves, which are quite normal geological formations. But in addition to them, almost on every continent, there is a whole series of paths and tunnels which are obviously not of natural origin. The main difference is the perfection and amazing accuracy of how shafts, tunnels, and passage systems were worked. In the Crimea, a marble cave exists in the Qatar Dag Mountains at an altitude of 900 meters, which widens into a huge hall shortly after the entrance. Downstream is a tube about 20 meters long, which is probably filled half with boulders due to numerous earthquakes. Originally, this tunnel, which has remarkably flat walls, is said to have led deep into the mountains and eventually to the sea. The walls that are still visible today are in surprisingly good shape and show no signs of erosion. Otherwise, in this area, influences by flowing water change the limestone in a very typical way. But such traces are not found in this cave, which indicates that the walls have been specially worked. According to recent reports by Crimean speleologists, a huge cavity and tunnels have been discovered under I Petri Massif, which may have once connected the Crimea with the Caucasus. An expedition discovered other tunnels in the Caucasus under the Uvariv Ridge and opposite Mount Aurus, which led to the Crimean Peninsula and the cities of Krandisvar, Yex, Rostov on Don, and the Volga region. One branch allegedly led to the Caspian Sea and the Krasnodar region. The Medvedidiskia Ridge is said to have once been a junction of tunnels. In the Caucasus, in the gorge near Geldenzik, a vertical shaft has been known for a long time, leading straight as an arrow and with a diameter of about 1.5 meters into the depth. The walls of this shaft, which can be proved to be several tens of thousands of years old, are so smooth that they could hardly have been formed naturally. In addition, the rock shows traces of mechanical as well as thermal processing. Here, and in other places where strange tunnel systems were found, the question must be asked whether these were created by humans or another intelligent life form. All in all, the secret tunnel network is said to have connected not only the Crimea with the northern regions of Russia, the further connections may have led as far as the New World and the North American continent. Secret Tunnels in Western Europe, America, Africa, and Asia On the border between Slovenia and Poland, Mount Babia rises in the Tatra Mountains with an altitude of 1,725 meters. Since ancient times, there have been stories that the mountain is an entrance to a secret labyrinth system, which is said to include tunnels to other worlds. Inhabitants of the village of Babi Agora claim to have once been in the passages themselves, the walls of which were also remarkably smooth, just as if humans had created them. The passage supposedly led to a hall from which several tunnels branched off. According to the legends, each tunnel leads from here to different worlds. Worlds can also be understood as other countries and continents. In England, not so long ago, miners building a tunnel found a staircase in the depths that led to a well from which strange sounds came. The well reached unusually deep into the earth, and it was not entirely clear whether it actually served to extract water or had once been a kind of connecting shaft. In North America, researchers found very similar installations. Tunnels leading down arrow straight halls with branching tunnels or well-like structures that may be further shafts to tunnel systems. At Mount Shasta in California, there is a network of nodes where various mines converge. In truth, the mines are said to be far more than just legacies of mining. Married couple Iris and Nick Marshall found a cave near the small California town of Bishop in a mountainous area called Caso Diablo, whose walls and floor were as unusually smooth as if they had been polished to a shine. 
In addition, the couple credibly reported hieroglyphic-like writing on the walls. One of the walls was even said to have small holes from which faint rays of light streamed. After strange noises were heard in the cave, the couple fled and later failed to find the entrance to the cave. In 1980, again not far from the coast of California, a huge cavity was discovered extending several hundred meters into the interior of the continent. A similar construct is said to exist in Idaho. This was explored and documented by anthropologist James McKean, among others. In Mexico, the ancient cave Santano de la Golandarinas gave rise to speculation. More than a kilometer deep and several hundred meters wide, the steep, flat, and smooth walls reach into the depth. There, researchers encountered a network of rooms, passages, tunnels, and branches. This could also be an ancient hub of intercontinental tunnels. In South America, striking tunnels are known to exist in Peru's Nazca Desert, Ecuador, and Chile. In addition, dozens of stories exist in these countries about underground cities and entire civilizations that are said to live, or once lived, in the Earth's interior. Some of the caves and passage systems known so far in South America are marked with the simplest drawings, which means that they were inhabited or used at times by primitive cultures. The drawings are clues to the unusual age of the passages. In South America, too, a number of tunnels are known whose walls are so smooth that they look like mirrors. In Southeast Asia, researchers have long suspected that the famous mystical place of Shambhala is actually underground in Tibet. The Tibetan tunnel systems are said to be guarded and protected by Buddhist monks today. There are some eyewitness accounts of people who claim to have seen Shambhala, as well as other underground cities and even an alien civilization. However, photographs or further testimonies are strictly forbidden by the monks. In the Chinese province of Hunan, complementary tunnel systems are found on the southern shore of Lake Dongting, as well as southwest of the city of Wuhan. There, Chinese archaeologists discovered the entrance to an underground labyrinth in a circular pyramid construction. Here, too, the stone walls were unusually smooth and appeared to have been carefully worked. Numerous drawings in the caves are said to show, in addition to some simple hunting scenes, entities wearing unusual clothing and appearing incongruous, exalted, or like gods compared to the rest of the depictions. While humans in the paintings hunt with spears, the alien-like beings seem to fly above the humans, watch over them, or dwell among them as some sort of superhuman. The Halls Under the Pyramids of Giza According to legend, there are secret halls, rooms, and passages under the pyramids and especially under the Sphinx in Egypt. According to some parascientific theories, a super race once retreated there into the depths of the earth. These entities are said to have a considerable influence on the Egyptian image of the gods or to be identical with their deities. According to an old tradition, under the paws of the Sphinx is a library of wisdom which contains all knowledge about this world and the cosmos. Although investigations are said to have taken place, no rooms have been found so far. Some alternative researchers claim that the rooms are much deeper than previously thought. In fact, there are reports that shortly after the Sphinx was uncovered, a worker came across numerous rooms and shafts inside. He and a summoned scientist would have suddenly found themselves standing inside front of a door protected by a semi-transparent curtain, or rather a strange energy. It was impossible for the two men to cross this paw. This happened in the year 1818. In the present time, scientists claim that there are no premises in or under the Sphinx. The entrance to the inner rooms is said to have been on the back as well as under the ears, and amazingly, there are traces there today that allow us to draw conclusions that the entrances were sealed with cement not so long ago. The Sumerians were people who lived more than 6,000 years ago in what is known as Mesopotamia, or the Fertile Crescent. The Bible did not come along until long after the Sumerians. But today, there is growing evidence that much of Christian mythology was taken from the Sumerians. The Sumerians were far more than religious pioneers. This culture invented the wheel, writing, glass, units of weight, the calendar, and beer. The Sumerians practiced agriculture and were one of the first peoples in Eurasia to build complex cities with irrigation systems. 
At this point, aren't you surprised that virtually nothing is taught about the Sumerians in school? And is this a coincidence, or could it be an attempt to cover up unpleasant truths? The Founders of Our Culture We live every day with the inventions of the Sumerians. If you look at your watch and the second hand moves 60 times until one minute is completed and in 60 minutes one hour has passed, you are looking at the time system introduced by the Sumerians. Your car wouldn't run without the wheel, nor could your bike carry you easily across the asphalt or your bus take you to college if we didn't have the wheel. Even basic mathematics, geometry, measurements of degrees and angles, social events, conversation, makeup, and architecture are all thanks to these people. You probably won't be surprised if we tell you now that the Sumerians also developed the complex writing system. Only the cuneiform writing of the Sumerians allowed the writing down and transmission of whole, complex sentences. Before that, only simple pictograms were in use. It is therefore almost unbelievable what wealth this culture has left us, and that its social system and the everyday order of the people also form the basis of our life 6,000 years later. Creators of Religion we knew nothing about the Sumerians until a rich collection of clay tablets and stone tablets was discovered more than 150 years ago in what is now Iraq. Thanks to the translation of the tablets, we now know that many of the religious texts bear astonishing resemblance to the narratives of the Old Testament. Sometimes the protagonists are called a little differently or parts of the Sumerian mythology never found their way into Christianity. Other stories and narratives have been taken over almost one-to-one. -one. The Gigamesh epic consists of several tablets found on cuneiform tablets. Written in Akkadian, the work is a mixture of historical, mythological, and literary elements. It is considered the first known narrative work with dramatic content, which corresponds to the hero's journey still encountered everywhere in the entertainment industry today. The stories revolve around love and enmity, friendship and disappointment, and the influences of beings the Sumerians called gods. The second basic pillar of Sumerian culture and spirituality is the tale of the Anunnaki, who were considered supernatural beings. Anunnaki means something like having come from heaven or acting between heaven and earth. Each Anunnaki had a specific role or jurisdiction in Sumerian mythology. For example, Enlil was considered the god of air and weather, while Enki was associated with wisdom and magic. The Sumerians tell how Anunnaki share their knowledge with the people, bringing them progress. In fact, the Sumerians are a people who made a remarkable leap. From simple nomads and hunters, the people of the Fertile Crescent evolved into inhabitants and builders of complex cities with a social and economic system. The Extraordinary Astronomical Knowledge Fascinating and mysterious at the same time is the astronomical knowledge of the Sumerians. It is no secret that people observed the stars, the sun, and the moon thousands of years ago. But where do these people have knowledge about the oblique position of the Earth's axis, the resulting precession, and the 25,920-year cycle? Finds like these tablets raise further questions. Striking are the depictions of winged bowls and the repetition of cosmic aspects such as these seven points. It is further interesting that the representations of the achievements of the Sumerians, such as plows, sewage systems, or even the sewing machine, are shown again and again in connection with the sky people. It almost seems as if the Sumerians wanted to represent the involvement of the Anunnaki with this. At the same time, the Anunnaki are almost always depicted with stars and the seven points. The radiant star is almost always interpreted as a representation of our sun. Unfortunately, the Sumerians left no written evidence about which planets or celestial bodies they knew. The representations on the pictures were very probably clear enough for the people. Only we rack our brains today with the correct interpretation. If the star is the sun, five of the seven points could be the planets visible from Earth – Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. If the Sumerians had additional knowledge of the existence of Uranus and Neptune, they must have had either a technology, which we do not know, or they had the knowledge from another source. 
After all, from Earth, even Saturn can be seen only with telescopes. And curved lenses for observing the stars, however, did not appear until long after the Sumerians. To see the outer planets with the naked eyes is not possible. Other interpretations go in the direction that the seven stars shows the Pleiades. This group of stars was from some prehistoric peoples of the Earth of a mysterious and special meaning. As for the astronomical star map of this world, the sky disk of Nebra is considered today. The circular bronze plate, which was found near the city of Nebra in Saxony Anhalt, is more than 4,000 years old and shows, besides the sun, the moon and some stars, also a striking arrangement of seven stars. Several experts concluded that these seven stars most likely show the Pleiades. It is impossible to say today if early people looking at the sky felt attracted by this small but very bright cluster of stars, or if the connection was a completely different one. If you look at the night sky, the Pleiades are a pretty and unusual sight, but by far not the most conspicuous or even prominent star in the sky. Anunnaki – Friends or Oppressors the intention of the Anunnaki was to offer progress and development to the people. Basically also the money system, the financial economy with interest, as well as the economic system still valid today, go back to the culture of the Sumerians. Occasionally, critics of our present civilization claim that the Anunnaki were an extraterrestrial people who still guide the destiny of the human species today. This can be taken directly or interpreted in a transferred way. The number, money, time and economic system of the Anunnaki undoubtedly rules this world today, and at the moment we must come to the realization that these systems will destroy our planet in the long run if we cannot find changes in our way of life. So, a once well-intentioned assistance may have turned into a curse. Wild theories surrounding the mystical Anunnaki people go so far as to claim that this species created humans. Semi-wild humans are said to have once come to the planet as laborers for the sky people. When the mines in Mesopotamia were largely exploited, mankind was to be destroyed. Only the mystical figure of Enki stood up for the people. He promised to watch the people and help them develop. Archaeological evidence for such theories does not exist to this day. No evidence of ancient mines in Mesopotamia has been found, nor do depictions of the Sumerians actually show a people who acted in dependence or as slaves. Much more exciting and scientifically proven beyond doubt is the connection of the Sumerians to Christianity, or should we better say, it's the other way around. The Flood of the Sumerians the writings of the Sumerians and the Old Testament of the Bible have so many similarities that hardly anyone can deny that large parts were simply somewhat changed and taken over. Between the story of the Flood and the Bible, there are particularly many parallels. In both traditions, the Flood is seen as a punishment by the divine authority for the sins of mankind. In the biblical narrative, the Flood is portrayed as God's response to the increasing wickedness and corruption of mankind. In the Sumerian versions of the story, there are different reasons, but usually the flood is described as a response of the gods to the noise pollution and disobedience of the people. In the Bible, Noah is the chosen one, who is instructed by God to build an ark to survive the coming flood. In the Sumerian story, the hero appears in two different versions. Sometimes he is called Zizuzudra and sometimes Atnafism. This fact alone proves that the story already underwent a transformation among the Sumerians. Both in the biblical story and in the Sumerian traditions, the flood is described as a huge tidal wave that covers the whole earth and destroys all life outside the ark, and in both stories, a limited number of people and animals survive the flood inside the ark. In both stories, birds are sent out to look for signs that the flood is receding and land is becoming visible. In the biblical story, it is a dove and a crow, while in the Sumerian version, it is a raven and a swallow that go in search of land. So what does this mean for our Christian culture? At first, not so much. Biblical scholars have long assumed that the stories and verses of the Old Testament go back to much older legends. Only about the truth content and passages that are difficult to interpret are often disputed. 
Who knows? The Old Testament knows that there are demons fight against angels. People reach unusual ages of several hundred years, or miracles happen. People have always puzzled over whether these stories were written in code, mistranslated, or meant to be quite real. In the case of the Flood, scientists have been able to find several references to very real flood events in the area of present-day Iraq. Possibly the Mesopotamia was extremely flooded several times. Conceivable are also the effects of tsunamis, which pushed enormous water masses from the Persian Gulf onto the land surface. For deeply believing Christians, it can be frightening that the stories are quasi-copied or taken over. Especially people who associated the stories with the work of the one right God are naturally shocked that the same stories in the original were directed by several gods. A fundamental problem would get the Catholic Church, in particular, by the striking similarity of the history of Moses from the Bible with the legend of King Sargon of Akkad. In places, the latter is literally identical. Plato's writings about the city of Atlantis sparked a curiosity for ancient underwater cities that have not been satiated to this day. Several people have tried to find the ancient city, and it has become a staple of both modern literature and films. Above it all, it is still unknown if Atlantis was a real city or a mythical one. Real or not, the search and hope that Atlantis could be found has led to the discovery of several other underwater cities. While some, like Pavloptri, are thousands of years old and are remnants of civilizations long lost, others are merely centuries old and their discovery merely brought to an end debates about their existence. Still, a few are relatively modern cities that have been submerged under the sea for various reasons. These underwater cities may not be full of golden streets and palaces, but they tell stories and fill important gaps in history. And sometimes, the filled-in details shock the world. Olus, Greece Olus was an important port town in the ancient Crete state. Between the 5th century and 2nd century BC, it was at the height of its power and had 40,000 inhabitants. The town worshipped the Greek gods but also worshipped local gods such as Britomartis. Unfortunately, the town sank into the sea around 780 AD and there are different speculations on what caused its sinking. These claims have ranged from landslides to earthquakes to natural sinking of the landscape. The ruins of the town are located next to the chapel of Analypsis in Ilando Bay, Greece. Excavations on the site are still ongoing and some of its artifacts, such as its famous Apollo Sanctuary, are on display at the archaeological museum Heracleion. Villa Epicuan, Argentina Unlike the ancient city of Olus, Villa Epicuan was a tourist town built upon Epicurean Lake in the 1920s. The lake was said to have healing properties and the size of the town quickly grew. Located 370 miles from Buenos Aires, it was easily accessible by train. In its heyday, Villa Epicurean had a population of 1,500, but around 25,000 tourists visited in the summer months. It had over 280 businesses that included several hotels to manage the tourist traffic. Then doom came on November 10, 1985, when the dam that separated the town from the lake broke. Two weeks later, the town was evacuated. It was completely underwater and would remain so for 25 years. When it finally receded, salt residue had turned every building white and it was a ghost town as only one person returned to live permanently. Semina, Turkey 4,000 years ago, Semina was a bustling port. Today, it is called Kelikoy and it lies submerged in the sea near Kikova, an island located southwest of Turkey. Simona is a Lycian city and was supposedly the first democratic society with modern democracy inspired by its system of governance. The Lycian masonry used in its architecture is remarkable, with the medieval castle being one of its focal points. The castle was built to keep its occupants safe from pirates coming from Kikova. The ruins of Simina include a 200-seater Hellenistic theater, temples, and Lycian tombs. The site is protected by UNESCO and diving is prohibited. However, at low tide, parts of its structures can be seen above water and there are boat tours that can take tourists as close as possible for a clear view. Phanagoria, Greece In 543 BC, colonists fleeing Asia Minor after clashing with the Persian king Cyrus the Great founded Phanagoria on the Taman Peninsula. 
The settlement grew to become the largest city in the Taman Peninsula and a very significant colony of ancient Greece. At one time, it was even the capital of Old Great Bulgaria, which spanned from the south of modern Ukraine to southwestern Russia. Phanagoria was an important trading post and served the traffic between the Black and Caspian Seas. However, internal conflicts and invasions from marauding Huns and the Rus ruined the town, and it never regained its previous glory. The city of Matraga would eventually be built over its ruins. In the 18th century, it was rediscovered, and by 1822, excavations had begun. Originally covering 72 hectares of land, a third of the city had fallen underwater, with its ruins further damaged by the collapse. Mahal Bilapuram, India Located 60 kilometers from Chennai is an ancient underwater city of Mahalbatram, a major tourist destination and a UNESCO site. The discovery of Mahabalapuram did not come with the usual scientific excitement that accompanies such discoveries. It was both accidental and tragic, uncovered by the 2004 tsunami in the Indian Ocean. The receding tides caused by the tsunami exposed boulders and walls which led to an exploration of the structures. The excavation groups soon realized that the remains belonged to the submerged port city that was at its zenith during the 8th century Pallava dynasty. The discovered temples are known as the Temples of the Mahalapuram, and some believe they belong to a group of legendary Hindu temples that were submerged by the ocean. Needless to say, diving to confirm these stories is not possible as scuba diving and snorkeling in the area are prohibited. Yanagumi Monument, Japan In 1986, while scuba diving on the coast of Yunagami Island, Japan, Haruicho Arataki discovered the rock mass formation that would come to be called Yunagani Monument. Covering an area of 60 by 50 meters, it lies 26 meters under the sea. The rock formation has since sparked debates over its origin. Supporters of artificial origin believe it is a man-made monolith made 2,000 to 3,000 years ago and may be a remnant of the lost continent of Mu. On the other hand, skeptics argue that the submerged formation is natural and made of sandstones and mudstones deposited 20 million years ago, and the monolith was carved by natural erosion. If the Unigami Monument is a natural formation, it would be another of nature's wonders. However, if it were indeed a remnant of Mu, it tells the story of a lost civilization and makes us marvel at their sculptural prowess. Tequina, South America Lake Titicaca is the largest lake in South America and the highest navigable lake in the world. The lake has been a very important site of numerous Indian civilizations. The Incans believed that the god Kontiki Verochoka emerged from Lake Titicaca with the first humans. Before the Incas, the lake was also the home of the Tiwanaku people. In 2000, a team of archaeologists and divers discovered the ruins of an underwater temple in the lake which is between 1,000 and 1,500 years old. Its age shows that it predates the Inca Empire and was most likely built by the Tawanaku. The temple ruins are 200 meters long and 50 meters wide. The divers also found a village around the temple, roads, and an 800 meter long retaining wall. Thousands of items including gold artifacts have been found in the ruins, although only a few of them have been brought to the surface. Pavlopatry Pavlopatry translates to Paul's stone and is related to St. Peter and St. Paul who traveled the ancient world preaching Christianity. However, its historical importance goes beyond that. Pavlopatry is the oldest city ever found underwater with its civilization dating back to 2800 BC. Discovered in 1967 by Nicholas Fleming, it was originally thought to be a Miocenian era city, but research revealed it was much older. A year after its discovery, it was mapped by archaeologists and preserved. It is believed that Pavlopatry might have inspired the myths of Atlantis. Lion City, China Underwater cities are often the result of cataclysmic events like earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, landslides, or the combination of all. However, Lion City in China isn't an exception. It was deliberately submerged in the Quandao Lake. In Ming China, Xi Chang, which translates as Lion City, was the center of the empire and one of the most powerful cities in China, and for several centuries after. At one point, it was the political and economic center of the Zhejiang province. However, in 1959, the Chinese government sunk the city into the Kuaiando Lake to build the Xi'an Dam. Over 50 years later, the city is still well preserved. It lies 40 meters below the surface and has an area of 62 football fields. The 1,400-year-old city has architectural designs dating back to the 16th century. There are five entries into the city, 265 archways, numerous streets, and six main streets that connect all parts of the city. Atlitiam, Israel 
boats and other ancient paraphernalia have been discovered in Atlit before the discovery of Atlit Yeb, but the latter takes the precedence of interest. Discovered in 1984 by Ehud Galilee, the Neolithic village has been dated to be approximately 9,000 years old. The village was founded in 6900 BCE. It is believed that a 10-story tsunami caused by the collapse of part of Mount Etna in the Italian city of Sicily sank the village. It now lies 25 to 40 feet beneath the sea level in the Bay of Atlit. Atlit Yam covers the area of 40,000 square meters. Notably among its features is a stone circle consisting of seven stones weighing 1,300 pounds that may have been used for rituals. Baia, Italy Baia was a resort town that became synonymous with luxury and exotic entertainment. It has been described as the Las Vegas of the Roman Empire as the wealthy citizens of Rome engaged in whatever profane and prohibited activity they were inclined towards within its borders. The city was founded 19 miles from Naples, but naturally sank into the sea due to the composition of its soil. It was discovered in the 1940s and the official survey began in the 1960s, but the time in between made it a haven for looters. Today, it is a marine protected area. Dwarka, India Dwarka in Sanskrit means gateway to heaven and is one of the four Hindu pilgrimage sites. The discovery of the sunken city brought the age-long debate of whether Dwarka existed or not to an end. In the Indian book of Mahabharata, Krishna moves the capital of his kingdom from Mathura to Dwarka to escape clashes with his enemies. In modern times, it has been debated whether Dwarka was a city carved out of a myth or if it truly existed. The discovery proves the latter. The remains of the city were found 36 meters underneath the water in the Gulf of Cambay on India's western coast. Pottery, bones, and other items have been recovered, and the city has been dated to 9,000 years. That makes it the oldest archaeological find in the region, as other discoveries are 5,000 years younger. Palace of Antihrodos, Egypt Egypt might not seem like a truly remarkable civilization, but a journey down history shows how formidable the Egyptians are, which is why underwater Egyptian cities spark such strong interest. The Palace of Antihardos was discovered in 1996 by Frank Odido. The city of Antihardos was submerged in 365 BC along with the palace, which is speculated to be the resting place of the last Macedonian pharaoh, Cleopatra. Cleopatra had committed suicide along with her lover, Mark Anthony, after suffering defeat at the hands of the Romans in the Battle of Actium. Her tomb is still unknown and is perhaps the most obscure detail of her life. A Roman soldier who witnessed the sinking of Antihodos described violent destruction by the sea, which had receded to the basin floor, only to return with overwhelming force. Among archaeological finds in the site are a 30-meter-long ship filled with goods, 7-meter-tall pillars, sphinxes, and statues. Port Royal, Jamaica Described as the most wicked and sinful city in the world, Port Royal was second to none in its profanity at its peak. After Boston, it was the biggest European city in the New World and a center of British power. It was a home to pirates, sex workers, and plantation slaves. When it was all but wiped out by nature in 1692, some were happy and believed it was God's punishment. In June 1962, a 7.5 earthquake struck the island. Most of Port Royal was built on sand, and when the earthquake hit, the soil liquidated and several people were sucked into the earth. Geysers erupted and a wave of tsunami swept through the town, finishing the job the earthquake started. Thonis, Herocleon, Egypt there have been suggestions in ancient texts of the existence of Thonis, but before it was discovered in 1999 by French archaeologist Frank Godio, it had taken up an Atlantean aura. In Egypt, the port city was called Thonis, but the Greeks called it Heracleon. It was said that Hercules, the Greek demigod, visited the city and the city's patron deity was Amon, the Egyptian equivalent of Hercules. Paris and Helen were also believed to have visited it before the Trojan War began. All these, plus the fact that it was one of the biggest port cities in the ancient world, made it truly remarkable. Unfortunately, it sank into the sea and was lost for millennia. The reason for its sinking is still unclear. An accidental discovery was made virtually impossible because it was buried under an enormous amount of debris and sand. However, five years after he began his search for it, Frank Godio and his team found it submerged 6.5 kilometers on the coast of Alexandria. Buried with it were 64 ships, 700 anchors, and other items. Giants in religion and mythology in fairy tales and legends around the world, the existence of giants is actually no big deal. They are as commonplace as dwarves, elves, and gnomes. But let's leave the world of fairy tales and myths aside for a moment and look at the major world religions. 
In Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, giants are often depicted as superhuman, gigantic beings. As mixed beings of humans and gods, the Nephilim worked in the traditions of the Old Testament, and of course in Christian mythology, we know the story of Goliath, the Philistine giant who was fought by David. In Hinduism, giants known as Asuras or Rakshasas play an important role as antagonists of the gods and divine beings. In Hindu epics such as the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, giants appear as powerful demons fought by heroes to preserve the balance between good and evil. In Buddhism, giants are mentioned in the Pali Canon, among other places. They usually appear as parts of folk traditions and symbolize human vices such as greed and anger, which must be overcome to attain spiritual enlightenment. It was only in modern times that giants suddenly became beloved and appeared in the stories of Roald Dahl and the Harry Potter series, among others, where the giant Hagrid plays a key, positive role. Among the Sumerians, an ancient Mesopotamian civilization, giants were known as Anunnaki. They were considered divine beings who played an important role in the creation and guidance of the world. In Sumerian myths, giants are often present as crucial players in epic stories. To this day, scholars and religious experts argue over whether the giants in the stories were true flesh and blood entities or purely archetypal concepts. Real Giants – Do They Exist? Many consider the story of Goliath the Giant, who was tricked by little David, to be the most authentic depiction of an ancient giant. Goliath is described in the Bible in the first book of Samuel, chapter 17. Then there came out of the camp of the Philistine a fighting man whose name was Goliath, and he was of Goth. He was six cubits and a span tall. Six cubits and a span equals a little over ten feet. Goliath is not described as a magical or divine being at any point in the story, but as a fighter like everyone else, only he was just unusually tall. Goliath fought as a Philistine against the Israelites and the much smaller David gladly accepted the challenge. With a slingshot, David brought down the giant instantly and prevented a war. It is often speculated whether Goliath the Philistine may have suffered from pathological growth in size. Acromegaly occurs when the pituitary gland secretes too much growth hormone. The disease is rare overall, yet it does occur. The tallest man in modern times, Robert Wadlow, suffered from pathological growth in height, reaching a stately 2.72 meters. However, Wadlow's bones and musculature suffered from the enormous size. The young man could barely walk without AIDS and died of heart failure at the age of only 22. Even the current tallest man in the world, Sultan Kozan, has to walk with a cane because his bone growth can't quite compensate for the increase in size. Andre the Giant shows that not all people with enormous height growth have to be physically frail. Andre the Giant was a true giant, born in Grenoble, France in 1946. He grew to only 2.24 meters tall, but weighed an impressive 275 kilograms and appeared as a popular wrestler in the 1960s. Andre was admired for his strength and size and was known for his impressive matches and feuds with other wrestling legends like Hulk Hogan. However, even the popular Andre didn't reach too old an age. He passed away on January 27, 1993, at the age of only 46. Nephilim the Mysterious Giants of Christianity In the Old Testament, in addition to Goliath, a fighter who appears consistently human appear the Nephilim, mysterious figures who are involved in the struggle of good against evil. In Genesis chapter 6, the giants appear as mixed creatures of human women and God-men. But when men began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of the gods saw how beautiful the daughters of men were, and they took from them all whom they wished. In those days, the giants lived on the earth, and even later, when the sons of gods went into the daughters of men and they bore them children. These are the heroes of ancient times, the famous men. Unfortunately, the official Bible gives no further information about who or what exactly the Nephilim were. Some scholars interpret them as descendants of angels and human women. This approach states that the sons of gods were fallen angels who mated with the daughters of men, resulting in the Nephilim. In the scientific community, there are many different theories and thoughts about the Nephilim. Some believe they are purely mythological figures used in stories of early history to convey moral or religious teachings. 
Others see the mention of the Nephilim as an indication of the diversity of beliefs and myths in the ancient world. They could serve as a symbol of the mysterious, unknown, or supernatural in the human imagination. Some scholars search for possible historical or archaeological evidence of the existence of the Nephilim, but so far there is no clear evidence that they actually existed. In pre-astronautics and among esotericists, the Nephilim of the Bible are a reference to an intermingling between humans and very large entities that were thought to be gods, but were very likely extraterrestrials. These theories speculate about a possible genetic manipulation or breeding carried out by extraterrestrials to create on Earth a race that was initially intended to work in mines in Mesopotamia and eventually, after the departure of the god beings, were left to fend for themselves. The Old Testament unfortunately does not further describe the deeds of the Nephilim. Historians put hope in the Bible writings which were found near the Dead Sea. Their individual fragments are to describe the Nephilim and their role in the history of mankind, as well as more near. However, up to now the writings are present only in fragments and fragments. A clear picture has not emerged so far. Certain theories about the Nephilim coincide with the Sumerian legends, which are considered the direct precursors of the Christian traditions in the Old Testament. Giants Among the Sumerians Giglamesh is a central figure in Sumerian gods and religion. The prominent figure is described as a semi-divine king and extremely powerful and strong. While it is not specifically mentioned that he was a giant, numerous illustrations show the human as oversized, and thus Giglamesh sometimes carries a full-grown male lion under his arm like a lapdog. Giglamesh was two-thirds god and one-third human, as his father was a god and his mother was a mortal woman. His strength and abilities were extraordinary, and he performed many heroic deeds and passed numerous adventures. The second spiritual pillar of the Sumerian culture was formed by the Anunnaki, godlike supermen or entities, who are also often depicted oversized in effigies. Historians and archaeologists today push the representation of the Sumerians and other peoples predominantly in the realms of the legends because around the giant stories and mysteries there is a small problem. No bones or skeletons have ever been officially found that point to the true existence of giants. At least, that's what official statements on the subject say, but if we look closer, we will soon realize that this is not so. Giants All Over the World The U.S. American amateur archaeologist Ralph Glidden discovered several cemeteries about 100 years ago where unusually large people were buried. Glidden is said to have unearthed the skeletons of about 3,000 people who were 2.2 to 2.6 meters tall and had hands with six fingers. These giants lived 5,000 to 7,000 years ago on some small islands off the coast of what is now California. Glidden's find mysteriously disappeared and all that remained were a few photos that proved that the excavations really existed. In the last two centuries, skeletons of giants have been repeatedly excavated on the American continent both in North America and in South America. The only evidence of these finds today are often newspaper reports which seem rather insignificant. There is no trace of the artifacts themselves. The discovery of the Guadalupe woman, whose half-skeleton suggested that the real woman must have once been around 5 meters tall, also became world famous. The legends of the U.S. indigenous population also tell of tall, light-skinned giants with reddish hair. But strangely enough, all archaeological findings around these giants have also disappeared over time. So did a finger of a giant that turned up in Egypt in the 1980s. The finger was offered for sale to a Swiss adventurer and amateur archaeologist. Since the man lacked the money, he turned to the German Bild newspaper. After the latter showed interest and promised support, the Swiss traveled back to Egypt, but he was unable to locate the antique dealer who had offered the finger a few weeks earlier. All this seems most strange and dubious. Quite a few people would like to see another clear indication of the existence of giants in structures that are oversized or contain stones that can hardly be moved by humans alone. Many ancient temples or structures like those in the rock city of Petra are so oversized that they resemble giants. The largest stone ever moved for construction purposes the 1,000-ton Stone of the South at the Baalbek Temple Complex is said to have been brought there by giants. 
Some also rumor that structures like the pyramids were built by giants or supermen, and giants are also said to have been at work in the megalithic structures at Stonehenge, Karnak, and Avebury. But officially, everything went on here with completely normal forces and giants existed allegedly only in the fantasies of humans. What do you think? Is this all nonsense and there are natural explanations for giants anyway? The oversized buildings? Or is there something to the giant story?